black folks said if you don't knock this mess off which is a violation of the u.s constitution mind you we would carry ourselves to washington dc and march all around that white house that we built you got the game twisted the specific goal of the campaign was to pressure the u.s administration headed by president roosevelt to end discrimination in the government the armed forces and the defense industries check out the video in its entirety to find out if they made their point crystal clear i'll be back Hello, those who are returning, welcome back. New listeners, thank you for your support. Check out the rest of our videos. I'm sure you can find something that you would enjoy learning. And share, like, comment. We appreciate all the support. Um, today we'll be talking about Executive Order 8802, the Fair Employment Practices, that came about because of pressurization from the black community. But before we go into that... Let's talk a little bit about how black men were treated during Civil War. Despite their proven record as effective, courageous combat troops, black American men still faced a long struggle for equal treatment. During the Civil War, black troops were often assigned tough, dirty jobs like digging trenches. Black regiments were commonly issued in inferior equipment and were sometimes given inadequate medical treatment in racially segregated hospitals wow i guess that's where i say surprise surprise black american troops were paid less than white soldiers some black units such as 54 massachusetts infantry refused to accept any pay as long as the rate remained unequal the Lincoln administration and Congress dragged their feet on this matter until they finally established equal pay near the war's end. As soon as the Civil War began, many free black men in the North wanted to fight for the Union cause. Frederick Douglass, who escaped from slavery to become a famous abolitionist leader, stated, We are ready and would go. But prejudice against black people, both free and slave, was strong and deep in the North as well as the South. See, the North always wants to paint this picture. We know the South had cave mentalities, but, you know, we were a little more sophisticated. No, you weren't. Let's continue. Most white Americans at the time thought of black adults as children lacking in mental ability and discipline and they still think the same doggone way let's continue slavery had stripped black men of their manhood so the thinking went making them dependent and irresponsible these stereotypes led most whites to assume that a black man could never be trained to fight like a white soldier you know it's 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 amazing how some people think they are professionals in everything. Can even tell the sun when it come up and when it should go down. Let's continue. During the early part of the war, President Lincoln opposed accepting blacks into the army. He said that this would push broader states like Missouri over to the Confederacy. In effect, both free black men and escaped slaves were banned from the Union army. Major General Benjamin Butler commanded the Union forces that had captured and occupied New Orleans in the spring of 1862. The Confederate government of Louisiana had informed a militia consisting of free black men led by their own officers. This all black militia came to Butler and volunteered to join the Union Army. After some hesitation, Butler accepted the offer. 
he transformed the Confederate militia into the first regiment native Louisiana guards led by black captains and lieutenants. He later went on to form two more black regiments, which were commanded by white officers. These became the first, though unofficial, units of black troops in the Union Army. In July 1862, Congress passed a law permitting black men to enlist at a pay rate of 10 per month, $10 per month, $3 less than the pay of white private of a white private. But Congress left it up to the president to determine the duties of black volunteers. Lincoln decided that any blacks enlisting in the army were to be used only as laborers and not trained as combat soldiers. In November 1861, Union troops established a base at Port Royal on one of these islands. During the first months of the occupation, many escaped slaves called contrabands joined the U.S. joined the Union Army as laborers, cooks, teamsters, and servants. In March 1862, Major General David Hunter took command of Port Royal. Hunter had fewer than 20,000 regular troops to defend the Union foothold in the South. Consequently, he immediately began to recruit contrabands into a separate black combat unit. But Hunter's bold actions upset many in the U.S. government, including the president. Lincoln stood by his decision not to enlist blacks as regular soldiers with no authority to pay his black troops. Hunter disbanded the regiment. And they praise Lincoln so much, right? Let's continue. That what, if you checked out a video I did called, it was talking about the emancipation and what really happened to black folks when they were so-called free. Um, I talked, to, I, I said it seemed like it was a setup, that emancipation was a setup because they just knew that black folks away from the plantation wouldn't know how to survive and then you you release them out into the wild i'm talking about these 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 notorious barbaric cave mentality that some enslavers had you release them out into the wild and just knew that they were just going to be decimated think about it you release them out you release them from slavery with nothing let's continue but the U.S. government, including Lincoln, was gradually moving toward the idea of using black soldiers. Using them or using them? That's the question. Let's continue. Only a few months after Hunter disbanded his regiment of black volunteers, Lincoln's new Secretary of War, Edwin M. Stanton, authorized the military governor at Port Royal to do exactly what Hunter had tried to do. Unfortunately for Hunter, the War Department believed he had alienated too many people to be the one to experiment with black troops. So it was the governor. So it was the governor. General Rufus Santon Saxton, who was ordered to arm, uniform, equip, and receive into the service of the United States such number of volunteers of African descent as you may deem expedient. General Saxton enthusiastically began to recruit and train a new regiment of black South Carolina volunteers. This was the first black military unit in the Union Army officially approved by the War Department. In November 1862, General Saxton sent some of his black soldiers with white officers to raid Confederate positions, destroy war supplies, and liberate slaves. This first test of black troops in combat was very successful, much to the surprise of some of their white officers. And you know they got terrified. They was like, oh. And we thought they was kids. We thought they were childlike minded. Hmm. Let's continue. By the end of 1862, it was clear that the war was not going to end quickly. As this harsh reality began to sink in, the number of northern white volunteers dropped considerably. Moreover, Lincoln realized that once the war ended and the Union was restored, Slavery could never continue. 
As Frederick Douglass had argued all along, slavery was the source and center of this gigantic rebellion. For these and other reasons, Lincoln made a dramatic shift in Union War policy on January 1st, 1863, when he announced the Emancipation Proclamation. And who continues to say that the um, Civil War had nothing to do with slavery? <laughs> liars man that's just they just come up with all these lies to try to depreciate and devalue the huge contribution that our people made in this country as i've said in many videos if it wasn't for people who look like me this country wouldn't be what it's supposed to be today and today it's, it's, it looks like a mockery tell you the truth you got illegals coming over here making a mockery of this country like i said every time they do something against folks who look like me they always end up looking like the biggest fools on the face of the earth let's continue lincoln's emancipation proclamation liberated slaves in those areas still in rebellion it went on to announce that free black men will be will be received into the army services of the united states the black regiment at port royal celebrated the proclamation by spontaneously singing my country tis of thee sweet land of liberty of thee i sing the field commander of these black troops colin thomas w higginson later wrote just think of it the first day they had ever had a country wow that's profound all that you did and they still try to take this country away from you the natives the true natives of this land why do you think they want you to believe so much that millions came from africa like i said that that was physically impossible the millions came from people that was already here that they put in slavery they want you to think that you came from another country so that you don't have a claim here so that you could be considered an immigrant as them. No, they are the immigrants. We are the natives. And the truth gonna come out, watch. The truth is gonna come out where all those slaves came from. They didn't come from a distant land on ships. You know how many people, how many people died on those ships? How many people killed themselves, jumped over and drowned, was emaciated, got sick? Come on, man. Think. All, all it takes is a little a desire to know the truth. That's all it takes. Let's continue. In the spring, the War Department organized the Bureau of Colored Troops. The Bureau began a massive Army recruitment program aimed at free blacks in the North and emancipated slaves in the Union-held Southern Territory. All the new regiments of the U.S. Colored Troops were led by white officers recruited from existing regular Army units. Oh, my God. You know, I used to always wonder when I was younger, I didn't understand why when you saw a group of blacks doing whatever, it was always a white person in charge. I, I did not get it. I didn't get it until I got older. See how they psychologically mind F you? Let's continue. Combat for black soldiers and their white officers was doubly dangerous. When captured by the Confederates, black captives could be returned to their previous owners, sold into slavery, or even hanged. Their white officers were considered outlaws and might be executed upon capture rather than kept and treated as prisoners of war. Other inequalities plagued black troops. Few black Americans were commissioned as officers and black troops remained in segregated units throughout the Civil War. In fact, black American troops were not integrated with their fellow Americans until the Korean War nearly 100 years later. Despite the inequality, black troops in Union Blue have proven themselves to be courageous, effective soldiers. Colin Thomas Morgan, commander of the 14th U.S. Colored Troops, said, After the war, it had been shown that marching under the flag of freedom, animated by a love of liberty, even the slave becomes a man and a hero. So, I just wanted to give a little brief history of how black men were treated in the Civil War. And you know that happened in the 1800s. So let's forward 
Um, let's fast forward up to 1940s. And let's talk about how they still were treated almost 100 years later. Black leaders felt that black Americans can make the strongest case for freedom and citizenship if they demonstrated heroism and commitment to the country on the battlefield as they had done since 5,000 black men fought for the patriot cause in the American Revolution. No one put this more forcefully than Frederick Douglass did in the middle of the Civil War. Once let the black man get upon his person the brass letters u.s let him get an eagle on his button and a musket on his shoulder and bullets in his pocket and there is no power on earth or under the earth which can deny that he has earned the right of citizenship in the united states now you you heard what frederick Douglass wrote or said and said Black men had to, black people, black men had to do all that to earn a citizenship when most of them were born here in this land. And you see what they're doing today with citizenship? And, and black people shouldn't just be enraged. Anyone who came over here legally, anyone whose parents came over here legally, should be heated. They're making a mockery of citizenship. And you know, and they're buying votes. You know that's what they're doing, which is illegal. And they're doing it right in your face. The question is, what are you good citizens going to do about it? You going to demand a new government or are you going to just sit back and keep crying and complaining? Let's continue. Yet by the time the United States was attacked at Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941, memories of the 200,000 black men who had served during the Civil War and those who had served in every other American war since had been, if you will, lost at sea. Despite the gains of the abolition of slavery and the three Reconstruction Amendments in the Constitution, Jim Crow segregation had pervaded every aspect of american society since the 1890s and the military was no exception when black men volunteered for duty or were drafted following a japanese sneak attack they were relegated to segregated divisions and combat support roles support roles such as cook quartermaster and grave digging duty the military was as segregated as the deep south and it still is. It still is in so many ways. I hear how black folks are treated in the um, military services, which I still don't understand why black folks even went in law law enforcement and military. You can you can explain until you turn green. My question is, did it work out for you, and did it work out for all the black folks that came after you? Let's continue. So it is easy for us to see why it was difficult for black Americans not to see the hypocrisy between conditions at home and the noble war aims President Franklin Roosevelt articulated in his famous For Freedom speech on January 6, 1941. And because of the gap between the promise and the performance of American freedom when it came to race relations, many black people frankly felt alienated from the war effort. While A. Philip Randolph's threat of a massive march on Washington convinced FDR to ban discrimination against blacks in the defense industry in 1941, segregation in the armed forces persisted covering the conflict posed a problem for black newspapers either give in to the government's propaganda about racial harmony at home for the sake of the war effort and national unity or speak the truth and be smeared as coast conspirators with the enemy american history was rep replete with cautionary tales of disappointment and betrayal, starting with experiences by Frederick Douglass in the post-Reconstruction period and continuing through one evolving W.E.B. Du Bois during World War I. What should black journalists and spokespersons do? 
Two months to the day at the Pearl Harbor, February the 7th, 1942, the most widely read black newspaper in America, the Pittsburgh Courier, found a way to split the difference. Actually, the newspaper cleverly intertwined them into a symbol and a national campaign that urged black people to give their all for the war effort while at the same time calling on the government to do all it could to make the rhetoric of the declaration of independence and the equal rights and amendments to the constitution real for every citizen regardless of race and in honor of the battle against enemies from without and within, they called it the Double V Campaign. Black folks, do you realize that you are still fighting a double war? You're fighting to... St I'll go into that a little later, if if I decide to even say it. Because at this point, I'm just... I'm, I wouldn't say I'm exhausted. I, I will never get exhausted for speaking the truth i'm just i'm getting kind of tired of folks sitting back like they don't have any strength or power and i ask you why you not by you not saying anything you're giving them strength and power and then you're not doing anything well what are we supposed to do i don't know you tell me if I, if you can look around and see what's happening in this country white black asian hispanic and you don't like it and you're still asking what to do then i don't know what to tell you just continue while the double v campaign was un and, 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 and hold up if i told you what to do would you be willing to do it or would you be scared to do it and I'm not telling, I'm not saying anything about violence. Oh my God, no, don't, don't mix up what I'm saying. There are things you can do within the law. There are things you can, you can say. There are people you can go and confront. And there are people you can tell them, look, you know what? You want to lose your whole career? You want to lose your whole political career? If you keep heading in the direction you're going... Because we have long memories. You have to let these people know that you're not tolerating their mess anymore. Let's continue. While the Double V campaign was unable to achieve its goal during the war, segregation in the armed forces remained official policy until President Truman changed that in 1948. It galvanized black people and liberal whites around a mission whose power derived from the elegance of its simplicity. Innovative, clear, and easily accessible, the Double V campaign prefigured today's most popular social media campaign. Using an impressive range of communication platforms, even gimmicks to spread the word during the critical first year of the war, more than 2.5 million black Americans registered for the draft when World War II began, 1 million served, and though they faced segregation even in combat, the courier was there to tell their stories, to fight against racial discrimination within the armed forces, and to insist that the quest of civil rights at home was just as important as the fight against fa fascism. When the war broke out, the overwhelming number of black soldiers served in segregated units rather than tackle integration of the military head on civil rights leaders A. Philip Randolph, Walter White, and others organized a march on Washington to protest discrimination in the defense industry, which well before Pearl Harbor was receiving lucrative contracts from Uncle Sam to build up Britain's and the nation's defenses. Eleanor Roosevelt met with Randolph and White to ask them to call the march off, but they refused. FDR then met with them, but they still refused unless he signed an executive order banning discrimination in the defense industry facing a public relations disaster. FDR came around and on June 25, 1941, he issued Executive Order 8802, creating the fair employment practices committee to enforce a new rule that there should be no discrimination in the employment of workers and 
and defense industries or government because of race, creed, color, or national origin. The march was called off, but it laid the groundwork for MLK's march on Washington in 1963 and established the mold within the black community to monitor race relations at home, even amid the war against fascism abroad. One man deeply concerned about all of this sat down and wrote a letter to the most influential black newspaper in in the country. On January 31st, 1942, the Pittsburgh Courier published a letter to the editor from James G. Thompson of Wichita, Kansas. It was titled, Should I Sacrifice to Live Half American? In it, Thompson wrote, Being an American of dark complexion and some 26 years, these questions flashed through my mind. Should I sacrifice my life to live half American? Will things be better for the next generation and the peace to follow? Would it be demanding too much to demand full citizenship rights in exchange for the sacrificing of my life? Is the kind of America I know worth defending? Will America be a true and pure democracy after this war? Will colored Americans suffer still the indignities that have been heaped upon them in the past? These and other questions need answering. That was a great letter. That is something you could apply to this country today. Those you, those of you who are in law enforcement and the military, those who look like me, is this is a, is this a better country for you at the sacrifice in your life? And answer truthfully. Your blood spills out on the soil when you defend this country. Are you and your family being respected for that? And are you only being respected because you're in law enforcement or military? Would you be respected the same way if you didn't wear a uniform? Let's continue. Then he proposed what he called the double VV for a double victory. The V for victory sign is being displayed prominently in all so-called democratic countries, which are fighting for victory over aggression, slavery, and tyranny. If this V sign means that to those now engaged in this great conflict, then let we color Americans adapt the double VV for a double victory. The first VV for victory over our enemies from without. The second V for victory for our enemies from within. For surely those who perpetuate these ugly prejudices here are seeking to destroy our democratic form of government just as surely as the Axis forces. The Courier was the most widely read black newspaper during the war with a national circulation well above 200,000. It had already run stories protesting the Navy's use of black sailors only as mess men. And on January 3rd, 1942, the newspaper denounced the American Red Cross refusal to accept black blood and donor drives under the title The Red Blood Myth. But nothing could prepare the editors for the in, for the enthusiastic response of the public to Thompson's letter. A week later, on February seventh, nineteen forty-two, two months to the day after after the Pearl Harbor attack, the Courier published on its front page an insignia announcing democracy at home abroad the following week the paper announced that it had published the insignia to test the response and popularity of such a slogan with our readers the response has been overwhelming henceforth this slogan represents the true battle cry of colored america as the editors concluded, we have adopted the double V war cry, victory over our enemies on the battlefields abroad. Thus, in our fight for freedom, we wage a two-pronged attack against our enslavers at home and those abroad who will enslave us. We have a stake in this fight. We are Americans too. Don't get me started. Let's go. Let's continue. The Double V campaign ran weekly until 1943. 
To promote patronism, the courier included an American flag with every subscription and encouraged its readers to buy war bonds. Double V clubs spread around the country. Among the campaign's features, the paper published a weekly photo of a new double V girl, frequently lifting two fingers in a V sign. Celebrity and political endorsements followed, including Lana Turner, who in a bit of cross promotion mentioned that her movie slightly dangerous featured blacks in the cast and former presidential candidate wendell wilkie wearing a double v pen which the courier sold for five cents as william f yorosco report a double v hairstyle called the doubler also became popular historian patrick washburn recalls as did double v gardens and double v baseball games other black newspapers soon joined the courier's campaign to measure the campaign's impact courier ran a survey on october 24 1942 it published the results in response to the question do you feel that the negro should soft pedal his demands for complete freedom and citizenship and await the development of the educational process 88 Point seven percent of readers responded no, with only nine point two percent responding yes. Those were the cowards. Yep, I said it. Ninety-two point two percent were the cowards. Let's go on. Needless to say, not everyone was pleased with the double V campaign. The federal government systematically monitored the black press. We know that including this campaign during the war accordingly to avoid charges of disloyalty or right, the, the nerve what accordingly to avoid charges of disloyalty or aiding and abetting the enemy you hit oh my god so they wanted black people to be loyal loyal to who what what has this country done for black people to be loyal? Name one. Name one thing you've done for black Americans to be loyal that every other group didn't didn't benefit from. What was that Kamala Harris said something on oh no, I'm not gonna do anything specifically for black people. No, no. What I do everybody's going to benefit we know that <laughs> that's the problem but when you give money to ukraine and you give money to white jews and when you give money to migrants they are the only ones benefiting Ugh. let me go on the courier's editorial added a caveat to its poll results no one must interpret this as a plot to impede the war effort negroes recognize that the first factor in the survival of this nation is the winning of the war but they feel integration of negroes into the whole scheme of things revitalizes the u.s war program in September 1945, the double V insignia disappeared from the newspaper, replaced in 1946 by a single V, indicating that more work combating anti-black racism needed to be done at home. But as Clarence Taylor concludes, although the Courier could not claim any concrete accomplishments, the Double V campaign helped provide a voice to Americans who wanted to protest racial discrimination and contribute to the war effort. While the Courier's campaign kept the demands of black Americans for for equal rights at home front and center during the war abroad we can also argue that the double v campaign had at least two important legacies following the war first through the columns of his sports writer wendell smith which featured prominently in the film 42 it doggedly fought against segregation and professional sports contributing without a doubt to the to the Brooklyn New York Dodgers decision to sign Jackie Robinson in 1947 which in turn had a ripple effect and on July 26 1948 President Harry Truman issued executive order 9981 which ordered the desegregation of the U.S. armed forces which with that action the double V campaign had at last realized one of its principal goals 
the military service of black men and women before and after the desegregation order and the strength of the double v campaign helped to inspire the modern civil rights movement that began in earnest just after the war ended both efforts remain worthy of remembrance that would be the conclusion well i i'm concluding um it seemed like it wasn't that long the article wasn't that long but uh it wasn't that lengthy but it was exhausting very informative for me and i hope it was for you but it was exhausting because you see how it never really changed for black folks and you can come with your list of things that you feel changed and was you know it's better and what have you but it still hasn't changed the mentality hasn't changed you know they're supposed to, they're supposedly more wealth circulating through our communities but a lot of our communities have nothing to show for it i'm really considering um starting up well i will be i will be starting a podcast that way i will be able to speak more freely more openly about issues in this country period this country um life in general specifically you know i don't know when i'll do it but i will put i will announce it when i do it i don't know i don't know folks uh, you know me i've been a writer i've been a writer writer i've been one to i've been a fighter for years I'm not the type of person to just sit up and do videos and just talk about, you know, what's going on in the country, getting everybody riled up and upset and sit back and be like, OK, now go out there and do the work. You know, I, I would be, hey, 10 toes down, but I'm not going to try to be a crusader because I didn't I didn't did it. I didn't put my money where my mouth is. And it's like, I really despise when you have people that go out there and actually do the work. And then you have other people that find all kind of excuses not to do it. And about the main, the main reason a lot don't want to do it is because they're afraid, but they're not going to admit it. But then when it's successful, whatever the people that were willing to go out there and be on the front lines, when they do it and it's successful those are the ones the ones that sat back in the cut and watch you do it and waiting to see the outcome they want to come and cheer with you it's like sit sit your ass down go in the house and bury your head because you didn't participate in this now people that really can't go out there and do it they have so much to do at home responsibilities they can't get away i'm not talking about you i'm talking about the ones that can do it and they are afraid to do it and black folks i'm speaking directly towards you if you can if you can continue to in a sense ignore the migrants that's invading your communities but get upset with people who look like you and and do not hesitate to step to them in whatever way you deem you have a right to you should not say a word and you get mad because somebody accidentally stepped on your shoe that is why they mock you you fight and get angry over the stupidest things but when it's time to step up and fight where you at all right i'm i'm done for the day um thank you for your time and attention and support thank you uh for those who donate we appreciate it um it should be a link in this channel under these videos where you can give super chats or whatever and i have a link to um i think it's uh what cash cash app in the description somewhere thank you thank you for like commenting and subscribing and what have you and i will see you in the next video